Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Hi. 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 I'm Linda Dano. And I'm Dee Kelly. Welcome to <coughs> Attitude. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now, so many of you, and God bless you, write to us to give us ideas and things you find and things you make. Some of them are wacky. Some of them are really very valid, and we appreciate it. But they're so, all fun. They're all fun. We thought this yeah. was very fun. Yeah. This is the earrings book that you can get. There we go. We'll straighten it out. Uh, 32 punch-out earrings anyone can make. They're out of paper. Out of paper. Right. And you get the hooks inside. Right. And this is what they look like when they're done. Here's one for you, a pineapple one. You see? There they are. Who's got this? Can you imagine? Look at them. This is a good project for your kids to make. For, for, for their friend. You know, that is a good idea. Yes, it is. For kids. Uh, you know, young little, little, earrings. little girls. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And it's only $9.95 and you can get it in any bookstore. Look at our audience. We have, we have them on a few of our audience members. And they there love they them. Don't, Don't you? Don't you? We love Smile. Them. Yeah. You love them. <laughs> love them. <laughs> Couldn't live without them. So this is, this is a Christmas idea, if you're looking for ideas. Okay. This now... <clears throat> we think is brilliant. Yeah, it is a good idea. This, this is from Dorothy Hem, a viewer of ours from Dunedin, Florida, and okay. she created this little device to keep hairspray <laughs> like the salons do. Enough. Good. Done. Enough. Okay. For bulletproof hair. Yeah, and it doesn't get into your eyes or, or your, your ears. Forehead. Or your ears. Or your why would you have, oh yeah, yeah, It's right. covering your ears. My right. show. Can yeah. you hear me? No. What? Hello, Dee. What? Yeah. Okay. But so, I th is that not brilliant? Now I I'm, think that's really smart. I'm going to sneeze. Are you? No. Okay. Oh, okay. Spray. Now, also, you know, hairspray can have its, you know, bad effects. If you get it on glasses, it'll ruin them if they're plastics. My curl gone awry? Yes. Well, that just... <laughs> we might. have to get the... That's the only the problem. The do back. This, for me, moment. would have to be cut out for right. the curl area. <laughs> yeah. We have to kind of go get this back. Yeah. Oh, my God, I can't go on unless <laughs> right. the curl... Is it it's, right? It's good. Is okay. it good? Great. Okay, good. Now right. we can now, continue. Third thing we've found. <clears throat> now... These are what we call theme rooms. The, the first one you're going to see, John, punch it up there, is called Spaceship. This is an actual a hotel room, you guys, and it's in the, like the moon and the rocks and all that stuff. And, and there's your spaceship, and there you are. That's your bed. Then the next one is a, a cozy igloo. See that? With a polar bear hanging over your head. What is that in the bed? On penguins, that? dear. I They're penguins. So. Does that, that come with checks in? No, no. That comes with the $75 room. Ah, and these two come with this room. It may get a little crowded. The bed, you see, is in that car. And this is called the Lover's Leap, and that's a 73 Oldsmobile. Now, these rooms are 75 to 175 per day, and they're all over the Midwest by Royal Hospitality Group from Minnesota. My reservations are in. How about you? I think I'll pass. <laughs> okay. You know? Yeah. I prefer the Pierre. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't decide, state. though. I'm yeah. in a quandary. I can't decide between the igloo room and the spaceship. You like those penguins, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I do. They yeah. were cute. You always did like guys in... Um, never Tuxedo. Mind. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> now, for not so funny, is anti-stress and anxiety for women. Oh, please. Lucinda Bassett is here. She's an expert. And from her own personal experience, she has developed a technique to help us all de-stress and manage our lives a little bit better. Are you going to, in this, in this segment, talk about the signs of stress? Yes. Uh, boy, I think that's important. You we know, were so many of us uh, totally ignore any stress signs because we just are used to them. It's nice to know what they are and what to look out for. And don't realize that we actually are experiencing yeah. a stress yeah. or anxiety yeah. attack. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I also am going to talk to a, a lady entrepreneur who has, a, has come up with a great idea. And it's especially important, I think, for, for all of you out there who are homemakers and want to have some kind of business of your own, this might be uh, what you've been looking for. If you can run your house and, and do all the things that that involves, and there's so many, you can do this job. It's very, you don't realize how qualified you are. Yeah, and you really are. Also, um, I, I had a very special experience. I was able to go down to Washington, D.C., where the AIDS quilt was, the memorial down there. And I talked to an awful lot of people, and I saw the quilt, and I have been able to bring it here to you. You're going to see it today, and I think you're going to see a whole new side. You're going to understand more, and, you know, we need to get involved more. That meant a lot to you. It you? did. It did. It was a very moving experience. So, yeah, you'll see. We'll, we'll show it to you. Well, 
On a little bit lighter note, yes. our next guest has been in show business since she was 18 years old. She started as a Las Vegas dancer, toured internationally with a chorus line, and most recently stepped into a very successful network television series called Major Dad. Now, the beauty in all of this is that neither Vegas or Broadway or even Hollywood has managed to taint this woman in any way. She is very successful and she's very real. You'll see. Please welcome Major Dad's mom, Shana Reed. Great, thank you. Tell us about Major Dad. Well, uh, Major Dad's a lot of fun. What's it about, for those of, of us who have not seen it? It's about a, uh, well, Gerald McCraney plays the Major. He's a career Marine, very right wing. He meets Polly Cooper, who I play, who's a widow with three daughters. And they meet, and Polly's a reporter. She does a scathing story on the Marine Corps. They fall in love. He proposes in the first week. And he's a stepdad now. He becomes a stepdad. Uh, mm -hmm. We got married in the fourth episode, and mm -hmm. then he moves in. And we're back from the honeymoon, too. Now, this is very much like your own mm -hmm. life story with your stepdad and all you kids. How did that happen? Well, my stepfather met my mother and um, proposed to her with six children and uh, oh. married. And, honorable man. <laughs> uh, honor, very honorable. Must have loved her a lot. We, uh, and we tested him in every which way when he came into the family, much like the girls do on the What's the worst thing you ever did to him? Do you remember? Oh, the <laughs> worst. Nothing. That I'm willing to admit. Let's see. But, uh, um, I mean, was it really rotten? No, we were just, you know, when you have um, this new father, uh, it's just, uh, um, I don't know. We, we didn't know adjustment. how to handle it. Yeah, it's a big adjustment. We didn't know what to think, how to handle it, and uh, we just put him to the test. I think probably to see how much he loved us and yeah. how much he was willing to, to be there. It. Yeah. yeah, so I just... Uh, we just love them. Has it, has it changed now that you're doing this show? Do you have a new understanding and a new relationship with your stepdad? Well, we, uh, we didn't um, put him to the test for too long, so we, we had a good relationship as of a long time ago. But he's very proud of, uh, of the show and me on I the show. And, um, and they tell me stories of when we were children, and they remind me of things that we did and, and, uh, as kids. So that's a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, stirs up a lot of memories. Yeah. We have a clip of Major Dad, yeah. and we're going to see it now. Let's see Shanna Reed in action. Okay. Okay. Casey never has to touch another Brussels sprout. I'm hawking Robin's violin. Elizabeth can drop out of school and sell flowers on an off-ramp. And this is not the best day of the whole year. <laughs> okay, Pop. It's almost done. All you have left is being dropped off in the middle of nowhere and finding your way back in the dark. Everybody likes that. Now I can understand why Dottie's here. Her husband's a general. And Faith is here because Dottie's husband's a general. Marty thinks she is a general. And why are you here? I don't know. <laughs> that was Jane Wayne Day. That was who? That was Jane Wayne Day. They, they actually is a tradition in the Marine Corps. They take the officers' wives through the obstacle course, uh, much like what their husbands have had to go through in any... Uh, oh, all for a better understanding? I think of their husbands and what they're about. Mm -hmm. So uh -huh. we, had, we had fun. Well, you're going to give us a better understanding because you do a dance... You, you were a dancer. Mm -hmm. Most a dance. of your life you've been dancing, right? Most of my professional life. Well, now it's kind of matching We've up. We've got to put on our sneak. Well, this was a, it's a cardio funk class. It's called cardio funk. It's taught by... Um, Billy Goodson or Andrea Lewent in L.A. and right. uh, it's a good card. It's a great cardio workout, but um, are we, we also have a lot of fun. Really stupid? Um, no, no. <laughs> no, no yeah, you're gonna look like right. I looked on my no. in my first class in my no. first few classes. That's uh, right. And this is how you stay in shape now, rather than dancing full time. Yeah, I don't get to dance full time. I go to dance class or I go to cardio funk or stretch and tone great. or machines or whatever. But I'm very. I'm it. a little slow. I well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Here we go. Okay. <clears throat> now tell us what we have to do. Okay, I'll, I'll do a couple of steps first off, okay. and uh, then uh, we'll, just, we'll break we down a little bit. We have music. Okay. Thank you, John. And it's like funky. Yeah, just so. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like that. Oh, I just hit the table. Good. Very good. This is good. There you go. Like the this. chicken. Yeah, like the old like the chicken and the go-go. Yeah, the pony. Ha! <laughs> so, so you, you want to do? Them? We're not doing anything really that you just did, but we just yeah. look like we're moving. So That's we're... the idea is to have fun and just. Uh, and this is cardiovascular funk. Cardio funk. <laughs> Shanna Reed, everybody. Under the pole. Under the pole. Stress out symptoms and anxiety attacks. What women 
can do. Stay with us. <laughs> this is pretty. More than ever before, we as women are trying to do it all, be it all, and have it all. We're a generation of overachievers, and consequently, more than ever before, we're suffering physically from stress-induced illnesses and anxiety attacks. But there is a way to ease the strain, and our next guest will tell us how. She's the co-founder of the Midwest Center for Stress and Anxiety, author of Attacking Anxiety, and a recovered, stressed-out woman herself. Please welcome Lucinda Bassett. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Dee. Okay, Lucinda. Everyone is listening, every gal on our attitude stage. <laughs> yes. But primarily for Linda and I, <laughs> why is this such a problem now for women? Well, we're living in a generation that is very stress prone for women. And you said it when you said expectations. I don't think women know what they're supposed to be doing right now. We're all wearing several hats. I'll take myself for an example. Here I am working about 40 to 50 hours a week, running a business and speaking and traveling. On top of that, I'm still fulfilling some of my mother's roles because I want to. I'm a mother. I have a three and a half year old at home. My husband has expectations for me. She has expectations for me. I have a house to clean. And so here I am trying to still be the woman at home taking care of the children and taking care of my husband and all the other things that come with that territory. And on top of that, I'm working 40 to 50 hours a week. And I think we're just a little bit confused about what we're supposed to be doing and what we're supposed to be doing with what we have. And when you're a career woman, as you and Linda both are, you're running around with all these ridiculously high expectations. This is the way that some women are. And consequently, you're trying. 90, you're doing 90,000 things at one time. You're probably not managing your time well. You probably have a lot of shoulds. We have something called don't should on yourself. I've heard that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Don't should on yourself. I, should, I, sh I shouldn't be late. I should make more money. I should go back to school. I should, I should have, have done weight. this. I should have done this. I shouldn't have said that. We're so concerned about what people think of us. I think uh, something that's really important to point out, people so often, D, want to think that stress is what's going on around you. They want to blame their husband or their job or their boss or their coworkers who don't understand. They're overworked, they're underpaid, no one appreciates them. And in reality, if you're stressed out, if you're unhappy or unhealthy or, or whatever, it's your fault, not your fault, but your personal fault, whoever you are. Tell me some of the symptoms. Some of the stress-related things. Okay, heart palpitations, number one, one That's symptom. number one? Yes. Dizziness, nausea, overwhelming feelings of anxiety where you're, where you're afraid you're just not in control of yourself. So you could be sitting somewhere. This happened to me. Linda and I were in Orlando, Florida shooting. We had had a horrendous schedule. And uh, also caffeine oh, is yeah. a stimulant. That's right. Bad. And I'm not a great coffee drinker. And that day we had been up at 4 or 5 in the morning. And I had a lot of coffee. I had such an anxiety attack <laughs> that night that she had to come in and get me. I was really? like, Lynn, oh. Lynn. Well, good for I you was... for talking about that because anxiety attacks are very, very prominent in both women and men, and I suffered from them severely where I couldn't drive three miles from my home. Tell me about your personal experience with that. Well, people like us, and, and you have a lot of energy. You're probably a type A personality, but there's a certain personality type that is more prone toward problems with stress. They tend to be people who are very perfectionistic. They overreact to everything. They're very sensitive people. They're very, in, they're very intellectual. They, they analyze something. In other words, if someone said something to you on Friday, you'd be dissecting it and obsessing you know, about it on Sunday. Linda okay. calls me up and says, are you, are you working? Are you working? Are you thinking about what that just happened? It's money. Now forget. Don't think about this over the weekend. Oh, she right. She says it right. to me all the time. <laughs> and what, does she want you to just put it aside? Yes. Okay. And you probably go home and you're analyzing and yes. thinking. And all the time. Well, I have clients who actually wake up in the middle of the night and go get their tablet and write things down. And they can't sleep. Their minds. Does it yeah. sound like you? <laughs> Thank you. And very much. What you've got to to realize is that that perfectionistic, overreacting, goal oriented, people, pe people pleaser, goal oriented person. That's exactly right. Very high expectations. Yeah. Your own worst critic. You always always trying to please everyone, especially yourself. That's what's causing your anxiety. Can, can the 1990 woman have it all? Yes, she can. How? She, she can be a homemaker. She can have children. She can travel. She can work full time. What she, whatever she wants to do. Something's, you, what you have to be willing to do is get a lot of good help. Now, this is ways to avoid the stress. Uh, avoid, uh, there are ways to avoid burnout. And the, the first thing you have to do is take responsibility for your own stress. 
all right, maybe I have a husband who doesn't understand. Maybe I have a difficult boss. Maybe I have to travel a lot. But how can I respond in a way that is less stressful? What could I, for example, yourself, what can I do to turn off my thoughts this weekend and get, get out and relax and get away from that stress? Because people aren't dying of natural causes in our country. A lot of women's diseases are stress-induced. I have to clear my book. Sometimes, this is where, sometimes I'll do this and, and Linda can't because she's got a much heavier schedule, not as much leeway. I will just not answer any phone calls. I can come home and have 20 messages on my machine. All right. And I just won't do it. I just take the day for me. And do you play? Yeah. Or just lay in bed sure and read I a book? I make sure I have fun. Yeah, fun. You know, you said something about endorphins. Who talked about those? Me. Okay. Uh, Linda and I. Well, you're, it, we make it so much more difficult than it has to be. And no, there's no magic pill. By the way, the number one prescription drug sold in our country right now is tranquilizers. Like and Valium. I, there's several. Anti-anxiety medication. You know someone who pops a pill when they get stressed out. That's not the answer. I don't want to tell my three-and-a-half-year-old, well, when you're stressed out, you pop a pill. What you have to do is change your attitude, and then you have to change what you can in your life. But 85% of the time, you can't change the fact that you have a busy life. Yeah. People come to me and they'll say, well, I'm, I'm a single man with no, no dependents. I'm unemployed, or I'm, the, I'm a CEO of five corporations, and I'm stressed out. Right. If you're alive, you're going to experience stress, and stress is a healthy thing. So tell it's motivating. Tell us what to do. What? If I'm having a stressful day, or I'm getting ready to have an anxiety attack, let's <laughs> say, okay, or someone watching okay. experiences this. What the first thing you should do is, you hit the nail on the head, avoid caffeine like the plague. Oh, it's the All right? worst. Do not drink any caffeinated beverages, and colas. nicotine. Nicotine Another is stimulant. a stimulant. I heard someone in the audience go, sugar. Ah, sugar. Avoid sugar like the plague. I know, I know, but you know, if you want to get up in the morning diet and, and have a rough day, important. diet, I cannot say enough about diet and exercise. There's so much to talk about. Uh, exercise, you should be, everybody should be doing something because it makes you feel better, even if it's just walking, walking. a mile because or muscular, half a mile. Because tension, they have proven, is only released through muscular activity. You're, that's exactly right, and, and you release something called endorphins. It's your right. body's own tranquilizer whenever you get yourself to a certain point in exercise. Also, when you laugh, when you're having fun, there's a reason you're supposed to do that. You release something called catecholamines. It actually makes you feel better. There are so many things that we just don't realize. The most important thing you can do is change your attitude. Right. Stop being so concerned about what people think of you. Stop being such a perfectionist. Things don't have to be perfect. Lower some of your expectations. Laugh more. Get out and have fun. Surround yourself with positive people. How many negative right. people do you have in your life? Don't work so hard. Don't take it so seriously. That's right. It'll you know, be there tomorrow, don't, believe it or not. It's not worth dying for. All I right? agree. Lucinda Bassett, thank you so much for thank being you. with us. Linda and I appreciate it. Thank you. Linda. Boy, do I ever. All right, the lazier you are, the more money our next guest makes. Come back. <laughs> to receive the Lifetime Attitudes tip sheet with information on today's show, call 1-900-773-4040. Today's show and issue number is seven. The cost of the call and tip sheet is $2. To avoid ordering duplicate tip sheets, please check your issue number before placing the call. Our next guest says that she teaches people how to be couch potatoes without guilt. Why, you ask? Because they can sit back and relax while she does anything and everything that they don't want to do, from balancing their checkbook to buying a frog-shaped cupcake. She calls herself the intrepid New Yorker, and we're gonna find out why as we meet Kathy Braddock. Hi, Hi. Kathy. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Tell me exactly what it is you do. Well, we take care of everything that people need to have done in their lives, from apartment refurbishing to party planning, personal shopping. We take care of people's lives on a weekly, daily, monthly basis. Whatever they need done, we do it. How did you come to this? How did you get this idea? Well, I started the business about seven years ago, and I grew up in New York City, and I really felt that it was the one thing that I knew how to do. I can't sing, I can't act, I can't dance, but the, I can get things done. Are, were you a homemaker at that time? No, but I am now, and that's part of the reason I went into it, is I knew I was going to be married, and I wanted to have children, and I wanted to do something <clears throat> that would make some money that 
would keep me busy, but also be able to take my sons to school or to do Halloween parties or you name it, I could yeah. be there. So I thought it was a very good mixture of professional and family time. Who, who are your clients? In New York, everyone from professional people who uh, work in big corporate offices to homemakers as well. Uh, yeah. Part of the thing we do is we help relieve stress in people's lives by doing all the should lists that Lucinda was talking about. Yeah. We can take care of everything. What's the craziest thing that anyone's ever asked you to do for them? Can you, can you remember something? Well, people ask us to do things that normally, I guess, people wouldn't really think they'd call people up for it, from simply calling into the grocery store a list of groceries that, you know, you'd think someone would want to do for themselves, but they just have so many things to do on a daily yeah. basis, they don't want to be bothered with those hassles. Like, I could call you up and say, could you water my plants for three days? I'm going to be out of town. Exactly. And you'd come and you'd do that. Right. What would you charge me to do that? It's $35 an hour, and it's usually two-hour minimum, so at the same time, we could take care of other things in your home that you needed done. Your windows clean, waiting for the cable oh, television, really? trying to get a phone installed, maybe not in during... Not in New York, not, not, not in our this, lifetime. Not, it would cost more million dollars. <laughs> not this period of time. Yeah. But what we also do is for people, for instance, who are moving into the city, we go around with real estate brokers, look for apartments for the people. Oh, so if they're really? busy at their offices, or they don't really know New York, we can tell them the different areas, what to expect, where the schools are, where their office, restaurants, etc. We look for apartments, we go back to them and say, these are two or three you should go and look at. They go, then they say, well, now what do I do? So then we arrange for the entire move, we oversee the packing, the unpacking. Then they say, well, we need it painted or we need it decorated. We and take you care, do that too? Take care of all of that. And then they say, well, now I've got such a great place, I want to have a welcoming, welcome home party. So we arrange for the entire party, and then we start taking care of them on a daily basis where they leave lists for us to do, or weekly or monthly, depending on exactly. Do you find dates, or do you go that far? Well, we're by not. By family, <laughs> set up whole well, households. By growing up in New York, I can do some of that, but really? not all of it. You know, interestingly enough, a lot of my clients, because I get so personal with them, do yeah. become friends. So in that can some happen. cases, we've hooked people up with Is people. Right? But it's not really something that we would even take money to do. I don't oh, think. really? That's like a freebie. Yeah, I think so. Oh, nice. <laughs> you know, you sound like you just do everything. You're like a dream. Do, are there clients that you have that just have come to use you for everything? Well, I think that's what's so interesting about the personal service business is when I started it and I told people <clears throat> what I did, they didn't quite understand it. Yeah. But once you use a personal service company, it becomes an integral part of your existence. I mean, you yeah. cannot function without it because you're then so used to giving all these things that you are hanging over your head that you don't oh, want to yeah. be bothered to to someone else to do. Yeah, if you can afford that, it's great. Now, what are your resources? Where, where do you find like odd things? Like uh, about a month ago, I wanted for my, my new house, you all know where I'm doing a house, I wanted stone sinks. I looked and shopped and called. I finally found them, but I did a lot of legwork in the process that I would have liked not to have done. Well, that's part of what we do. We, we would have done that legwork for you, and ultimately we find it. I mean, New York is such a fabulous resource. If you yeah. need anything, it is here. It might take a while to find. Yeah. But it's definitely here. Now, do you think this is just a New York thing, that it can't be done anywhere in America no, I but think, New York? No, not at all. I think that more and more, as you know, <coughs> even people in smaller towns get busier and busier, and there are pressures that, you know, you were just talking about on everyone that, yeah, it can definitely be done. I think if someone was to be interested in starting this business, whatever they're doing, they should not quit it. If you're working or if you're being a full-time mommy, uh, keep doing yes. it. Start out very small, start out on the weekends perhaps with two or three of your friends, you know, ask them to do, you know, ask if you can do things for them and, you know, take a nominal fee for it just to see if you like just it. Just to see if you like it. That's because smart. this yeah. is the kind of business where you have to enjoy schlepping, you have to enjoy yeah. organizing, you have to enjoy being able to make a quick decision. If you're someone who goes to a, a, a big department store and wants to buy an outfit and it takes you two or three hours to pick out that outfit, this is not the business for you. For you. No. you have to be very decisive and you have to be able to deal with a lot of hassle. And I enjoy that. I vent my frustrations by yelling at the cable company. I, oh, I really you? like it. You know, <laughs> other people can't stand it. I love organizing things. I can get them to show up when they say my, co my appointment has been wiped out of the computer. They, they'll show up. Now, you've been in business seven years. Mm -hmm. Do you mind me asking what your profits are this year? This year, my gross profit was around 200000 Whoa, is that good? So, that's great.
right. So, so, so you think that if someone is out there, a, a lady at home watching and looking for a, a new career, this might be the answer for her? I think it's something that if you're looking, and I, as I said, I wouldn't quit anything to do it because it's not an immediate source of revenue, but I would try it. You have, yeah. uh, there's no overhead initially. There yeah. is nothing to lose except to make a few phone calls, make a brochure. We have a referral business as well where people just pay us to phone in for yeah. resource yeah. information too. Right. But um, I think interesting. it's good. Good. That's great. I, thank you. That's interesting, isn't it? Give you some ideas. Yes. Steve, thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll tell you about a very special kind of giving. Please stay with us. For people who have been diagnosed as having AIDS, medical care and going to the hospital become a way of life. But many AIDS patients don't go to the hospital when they should. Why? Well, many times it's because there's no one to care for their pet, the only friend who won't desert them. But now, in New York, there is an organization of dedicated volunteers who help in every aspect of pet care so that AIDS-stricken owners don't have to worry about their pets. Here to tell us about a group called Powers is their volunteer coordinator, Laura Wiley. Hi, honey. <laughs> Laura, first of all, introduce us to your friend. This is Snapper, and Snapper is a six-year-old Legland Terrier. Hi, Snapper. Yeah, the girl? Hi. Yes. We can't see her face. Cute. And this uh, is one of your little wards? Yes. Um, uh, Snapper's owner passed away a couple of months ago, and Snapper is being um, adopted okay. by a wonderful person. We'll talk um, about how you do that later on, but tell us about POWERS and what it stands for. POWERS stands for Pet Owners with AIDS Resource Services, uh -huh. and what we do is we're founded on the fact that pets have a therapeutic effect on their owners. So we do everything possible to keep HIV-positive people and their pets together as long as possible so they don't have to worry about them or give them up if they're unable, physically unable to take care of them or financially unable to take care I of them. I can't even imagine what it must be like to have to go through dealing with AIDS, facing death, and the one person or thing that you love most in the world besides your family is your pet and you're worried about who's <laughs> going to take care of it. I was reading in some of the research that one guy just went into the hospital and no one took care of his cat and they found the cat dead in his apartment because he had nobody to care for her. Wow. Tell us what you do. What is your day like when you take care of your pets? Well, basically, um, each volunteer volunteers only what they will be able to do consistently and without really causing chaos in their own lives. And There you go. It's snappy. So Take a look around. We are trying to relieve the stress of um, of the clients. So what what we do is we there ask. There you go. Let's let's let her go ahead, Smith. There you go. Go to Smitty. So go what ahead. we do is we ask the volunteers to only give us the time that is that is definitely going to be there consistently. Because you can't just start right. this. You have to be very serious. Exactly. We're trying to remove the. How stress. was Powers started? Um, a gentleman started it about in, let's see, May 1988, they were incorporated. Because there is a need for it. He saw the need and he filled it. Now, he had, saw, he had seen in uh, San Francisco PAWS, which right. was with people, AIDS. Uh, um, pets are wonderful support. Okay. It's an organization in San Francisco that does the same thing that we do. And we, he, he and wanted that here he in New want, York, he, and there wasn't Right, one. he went to volunteer for the organization, and, and it didn't exist. So what he did was, he started the first organization on the East Coast, which is us. Okay. Now, how do you deal with going into an apartment or a home of someone with this terrible disease, helping them with their animal? Is every day different? Every day is different. Our volunteers go through a training process that is, it's long, um, but it's, it's very important because we have to deal with the psychosocial aspects of AIDS. We have to deal with uh, their fear 
their own fear of transmission, and we try and answer all those questions. And when you're dealing with somebody with AIDS, you may go in one day and they may be up and fabulous, and the next day they may just not want to get out of bed, or they may be actually nasty, or they may not remember you. Dementia is a side effect. So you're not only supporting their pet, but you're kind of supporting them as well. Yes, we, if the volunteer you know, chooses to get emotionally involved, and most of them do, that's kind of unavoidable, with the animal and with the client. What has this done for you personally, to be involved with this, and I, what made you want to do it? it to me, it was the best, best possible things, a combination of the be two of the best possible things. I feel really strongly that the AIDS epidemic right now needs as much support as possible, and I love animals. So to me, it just combined the two, the two most important things to me, and that's what I feel strongly about. Tell me what's going to happen to this adorable dog now, because you just told me that her owner has died of AIDS, and now she's waiting for adoption, and Powers helps to place animals in good homes? Well, a part, a part of the client application process <laughs> is we ask them. We ask them what there is a long-term animal care form, and we ask them what they would like done in the event they do die, and we, we abide by their wishes. And 98% of the time, we're able to get the animals adopted. How many care. people do this in New York? Uh, we have about 200 volunteers now. Great. Now, we'd like you to know a little bit more about Laura Wiley. We love her, <laughs> and she didn't know we were going to do this, but Laura works here with us at Attitude. She is our production assistant. We're not only proud of her, but it's, it's just wonderful what she does for us here at Attitude. She makes sure that Linda and I get all of our scripts, or we wouldn't know what was happening on any given week, probably. But besides that, her wonderful work for Powers is just extraordinary. She's an extraordinary person. If you'd like, that's right, talk to her. If you would like more information, you can write to Powers at Post Office Box 1116. Madison, Madison Square Station, New York, New York, 10159. Or you can call area code 212-744-0842. And now when I call you to tell you that I got my packets, I know what it means when you say, if you're asking about powers, I'll call you right back. <laughs> Laura Wiley, everybody. Linda. Up next, we walk among the threads of the AIDS quilt. It's really incredible how people have pulled together and supported one another during this country's battle with AIDS. And there is a very special group of people who organized the NAMES Project out of San Francisco, a city that is truly special. As many of you know, they began what has become known as the AIDS Memorial Quilt, and recently I was fortunate enough to travel to Washington, D.C. and walk among the quilts, which have been sewn in memory of so many loved ones who have lost their lives. They come from 19 countries and all over the United States. They brought with them 13 tons of quilting to show that they care. Their hope is that you will care. Back in 1987, when they first laid out these quilts on the grassy field just south of the White House, there were about 2,000 names. Now there are more than 12,000 panels, and officials say they get new ones every day. It's a very moving experience. You would almost have to be here to understand what I'm saying. You can almost feel the presence of all the souls that have gone on. One of the mothers of one of these, these people said to me that everyone here are just people. People who wanted to be loved and liked and wanted a hug and a kiss. And now they're gone. And I think you feel that as you walk among the quilts. Pat, you're from Ohio? Yes. Surya. You came all the way from Ohio to be here this weekend? Yes, my daughter and I. Tell me what having this quilt here means to you. It means that he can't be forgotten. He'll never be forgotten by us. But he can't be forgotten by anyone. 
our whole family had a part in designing and making the pen. I did most of the sewing. My daughter finished it because I couldn't. Yesterday morning I worked as a monitor and in the afternoon my feet were really tired. And I told my daughter, I'm going to just go hang out with Jim for a while. And I just came and sat with him. And I just felt like he was here with me. He knows I'm here. I know he got it. When you look at all the various quilts, there are some that have great personality in them. I mean, look at this. With the, with the fur for the, for the musical notes. They really try and capture the personality of the person that they're that they're showing their love to. Some memorabilia, something that belonged to them, memories that they shared, laughter they shared. Some of them are funny, but they're all filled with love. Want to talk about love? Talk to a nurse who cares for AIDS patients every day. It is tough, but not one of these people has asked for this. I don't care what anybody says. No one has. It's like this button says, where's the one? This one. Those who think AIDS is a plague sent by God have never met my God. And that's the truth. And, that, and that's how, how I, I go on with this. They're just like, I take care of cancer patients, too. And nobody asks for these illnesses. No I, I don't care what people say. And somebody has to care about them. This is for my friend Bill Perez. And um, this one had a lot of work in it. <laughs> Tell me what all those things mean. OK. The teddy bear, Bill had a facial deformity that he was born with. Mm -hmm. And he had a lot of surgeries when he was growing up. And he always had a teddy bear with him. And so that was the symbol of the teddy bear. The heart on the teddy bear was something that I stitched as I sat by his bed the last week of his life. All the elaborate craftsmanship on a quilt this size takes nearly constant tending, either by official quilt repair or by volunteers who just pitch in because they know how to sew. It's difficult for many of us to walk through this memorial display without a lot of emotion. How much more difficult if you know someday there'll be a panel for you? I was diagnosed two and a half years ago. Does this whole memorial service to your friends and to all these other people, does this scare you to death? Not really. Some people say I'm dying from AIDS. I say I'm living with it. And with the support and the love I get from San Francisco, it is a model city. Do you feel, when you look at the quilt with all your friends' names on it, do you feel that you'll see them all again? Well, it's funny because I wrote a little letter over there to them. And on the letter, I said, make sure when we meet again that there's a special place in your section for me. One way I found to deal with the emotions stirred by the quilt was to take advantage of the opportunity they give everybody to sign it. As I do so, I think of my friends who were killed by this disease. Liberace, or Lee, as his friends called him, Rock Hudson, another friend named Mike, and a friend named Paul. I'm gonna miss you guys. For others, mere signatures don't help, and that's when Judy Jacobs lends a hand. I had a very good friend who died of AIDS, and I was always involved in counseling and felt very strongly in my heart. I just knew that I had to get involved. I've seen you today with some boys who have lost friends, whose own life is in jeopardy. What do you say to these boys? Well, that's the thing. I mean, that's what I teach as emotional support coordinator is the truth is, there's nothing we can say. These are flowers brought by family and friends, and they're laid on the quilts. And at night, they are taken off the quilts so they don't soil them. Instead of being thrown away, they are laid out here on the grass lovingly. This was to John. May you be at peace with all my love, Jim, Molly, and Aaron. Not everyone who comes to experience the quilt knows someone with AIDS. Some are children. I was surprised at how many. Some are like Jane Gebhardt. She just felt she had to do something. I don't know anyone personally that has passed away from AIDS, but I'm just here as a concerned American citizen. I just think this affects all of us. And it's very emotional seeing how many quilts 
are, have been made, and uh, I just feel that um, I can't believe that this many people have passed away in the past two years, and that this has been assembled in two years. Yes. What do you you feel? Are you feeling that you're contributing in any way by being here? Do you feel when you see the quilts that you're doing something? Yes, I feel that uh, the more people that come out to view this, uh, they're, they're made aware of the serious situation of this epidemic. And I feel that being here shows the American people how many people are concerned. If you want to know more about the quilt and the people it represents, you should see the HBO documentary called Common Threads. One of the people highlighted in that documentary is Susie Mandel, whose son David, a hemophiliac, died at age 11. David was light and energy and music and everything that you expect. You, he was a meteor, he was a star, he was intense in his enjoyment of life. He had a wonderful sense of humor, he was articulate, he was very bright, and actually had no right to know half of the things that he did. Tell me the two things that David wanted to know before he died. Well, he asked me if he would have AIDS when he got to heaven, and I told him no. And he asked me if he would have hemophilia, and I told him no. And then he said, Mom, it's all right then. And uh, I wish I could have given him more, but those are the only two promises he asked. This is the last year the quilt will be seen in its entirety. Not because the problem is going away, but because next year it will be just too big. I thought to close our memorial that I would read you something from a letter that a man by the name of Chip wrote to his family and friends just before he died. Do this for me. Close your eyes and try to pretend that your time is very short. Make a list of all the things you would do with the time you have left. How sorry you will be if you wait, and then your time runs out. Andy, Bob, Juan Jimenez, David, lost blood. Um, it's interesting. I, I did learn something from being there. I think I learned a basic thing, uh, or maybe I relearned it, that we really are just people. And we all struggle, and we all want things, and we all try so hard, and, and we're just people. I think it was very interesting, that letter that you read at the end, mm. when it's th just due for this AIDS patient that died. Think, if it was your last day, do it all. Yeah. yeah. Life is very precious. We're going to show you, as we close, some more panels from the AIDS quilt. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Mm -hmm.